Hi there, welcome to my talk on Board Yourself, how to get set up for success in a new role. This is my first time speaking at any conference and I'm overjoyed that it gets to be at Write the Docs. Starting fresh in a new role can be really daunting. I know for me, it's hard to suddenly not be the expert anymore, to not have the trust and rapport built up with your colleagues and also maybe working with people that have never worked with someone in your role before. Shout out and respect to the lone riders out there. My goal for this talk is to leave you with a sense of structure for being successful when starting anew. I've put together five steps that we'll talk through that I believe you can use to show off your skills from the get-go. I'll make sure to share some examples that are loosely exactly things I've done at different companies. And just before I move on, this laptop was the default image for this slide, which I was going to change and then I realized it kind of represented onboarding in 2020. You're likely still at home, joining a video call just with a different company Zoom account. That's how it was for me. I'll give you a bit of context about myself so you know where I'm coming from in the rest of the presentation. My name is Michael Belton, but I'll often go by Belton because there are a lot of Michaels out there. I work as a technical writer at Canva, a company with the mission to empower the world through design. In my spare time, I love baking, but specifically silly baking. Think cakes decorated after your favorite pair of socks, a cake version of your favorite snack, or olives and carrots assembled on toothpicks to resemble penguins. You know, normal things. I don't use LinkedIn or Twitter too much, but I'm keen to connect with more documentarians, so feel free to reach out. Next, I thought I'd share my journey to technical writing. As I'm sure this is the same for most of you, we studied technical writing at university, then started working as a technical writer. Simple. No. These people do exist and are great, but most people I've met have had a more roundabout way of coming into tech writing. For me, it looked like this. I studied a bunch, got a job as a developer, discovered there are other roles that go into making software, and after a few changes and a lot of self-study, I became a technical writer. This shows the times I've moved craft, but within them, there were also a lot of team changes. My most recent change was six months ago when I moved companies during lockdown for the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, during all these changes, I went through a lot of feelings. I felt overwhelmed, nervous, uncomfortable, and particularly for this year, I felt isolated joining a new company from home. This is how I felt, but from talking with others, I think these are pretty common feelings. When I started, there were lots of acronyms I'd never heard of, names of people I was being asked to contact that I didn't know enough about, people assuming I already know their internal processes, being asked to make decisions about things when I don't feel I know enough, and sometimes being put on the spot as an expert in areas I don't feel skilled in. If you're in this situation, I can tell you that you're not alone. Most people feel this way when going through a big change. However, there are lots of positive feelings with change too. There's excitement, being energized, and feeling hopeful about the new opportunities. A big phenomenon that has had some good attention in the last few years is imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills, talents, or accomplishments, and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. That certainly sounds familiar to me. Being the newbie in a work environment can stir up feelings of panic. Tiny tasks that you struggle with can make you feel that you don't belong in your new role. It seems like you got lucky to be there, not that you got the job through your talent. You may feel paralyzed from a fear of failure, deny your abilities, discredit any praise you hear, and feel guilty about your successes. It can be hard to accept, but most people feel this. The overwhelming feelings will pass, 
that you'll likely need to manage imposter syndrome across your whole career. Even the most senior people that I've seen as mentors and high performers have told me that they still have days where they feel like a fraud. The key to getting through this is working to change the way you think. I've found journaling the best method to work on this. I recorded my achievements and then took time to reflect on them once they were compiled. When you can see that, you'll start noticing the doubts and negative thoughts as they happen. Then you can begin acting against them when you notice the thoughts. This will help you recognize your expertise and notice that no one is perfect. And remember, there are always people to talk to. You may feel vulnerable when you open up to someone about these feelings, but like I mentioned, it's likely that they have felt this way too. With that context, you might understand why I care about ensuring I'm set up well in a new role and feel a sense of stability, particularly during this pandemic. That's why I use this framework and why I'd like to share it with you today. The five steps I'll talk about are listen to get the context, understand the area, embrace feedback, find quick wins, and set longer term goals. These are useful for anyone, but I'll focus on how to use these for documentation specifically. The first step is listen to get the context. This is about taking the time to understand the company and team culture you've just joined. We all have our biases from our lived experiences, but often they mislead you in new situations. Before you tell people everything that's wrong with the way they work, listen to understand why it works. Coming in with all the answers can alienate people who could help you understand what's going on, and may dampen your chance at building trust and connections with new colleagues. You can definitely share your thoughts because it's great to get fresh eyes on a problem, but don't be surprised if there are other factors you don't know of at play. Listening to how the company got to where it is helps you recognize how people communicate and see their shared assumptions and values. This will all help you adapt to the culture. These are a few methods I've used to step back and find out the work culture before completely putting my foot in my mouth. These work in person or over video chat. You should listen to your team, stakeholders, and the company communications. First, meet with your team if you have one. The team is your home and will likely form your strongest base of support and help you with what you want to get done. Everyone will have different skills that you can learn from. The most senior may become a mentor, while the most junior member might have the best writing setup. Just know that there's a lot of expertise that you can make the most of. And remember, sharing knowledge brings everyone up. Next, make sure you meet with your stakeholders and a variety of people in adjacent roles. It's good to understand the expectations of your role from an outside perspective. You might think they're wrong, but at least you'll know where you're starting from. When onboarding to my current role, I made sure to meet with researchers, leadership, engineers, and designers. Once you've built these relationships, you can also look to them for support with the initiatives you plan. Finally, make sure to devour any company communications. These might be emails, Slack messages, town hall meetings, or onboarding sessions. These will help you get a sense of the company direction, how people think about their work, and let you start mapping out where you fit in. Given that it's 2020, I can't recommend talking with people without giving some tips for video calls, so these are mine. In small groups, keep your video on. It can get awkward when you're talking to no one, so make sure you give the speaker an audience. In large groups, turn your video off for a break. Fatigue from being on video is real and you need to look after yourself. It doesn't have to be for the full meeting, but if some people have their video on, then turn yours off for a few minutes as a break. Engage with the group. When someone asks the group a question, make sure you reply. It could be through chat or by talking. 
Forgive imperfect setups and environments. Most of us have started working from home without the ideal setup. The desk might be tiny and poorly lit, family members might make an unexpected appearance, or you might not have the best internet connection. Be kind, look for workarounds, and move on. Make friends with a mute button. You can use this to limit the background noise for a speaker and not take the spotlight with the sound of you drinking a cup of tea. I know I've been guilty of that one. Do you have a messy room? It doesn't have to be. Add a virtual background. I'm sure there are many others, but those were front of mind for me. Now, what to listen for. When you're talking to people, there are a few things to listen for. Firstly, how is work planned? Do people set up meetings to discuss the option? Are there goals and a vision? How do they use JIRA? Next, how do initiatives get support? Do you need a leadership sponsor? Support from peers? Or does the solution come from a lot of discussion? And finally, how is work communicated? Are there fixed deadlines? Do people set safe or ambitious goals? What happens if you don't meet a goal? Are there consequences? These are some example questions I've used when meeting with members of your team. The purpose is to understand what they own, how it came to be, and what's next. So the questions I've listed here are how did the content come to be? Who works on it? How is the content organized? What's working well? What issues do you see? What are the next projects? And if you were me, what would you focus on? Next, some examples of what to ask when meeting with stakeholders. The purpose is to understand what they expect from your work and how you can work together. So the questions I've got are, what goals are you working on? How are they going? How do you work with the docs at the moment? Have you contributed to the docs? How do you think we should work together? And if you were me, what would you focus on? And finally, some questions for talking with leadership. This could be your direct management chain or other key leaders you know of in the business. The purpose is to understand their expectations and how they see you fitting into the organization. So the questions I've got are, what do you think the biggest opportunity for me is? Do you know of any similar content initiatives? If so, how did they go? Who do you think my stakeholders are? And if you were me, what would you focus on? I found asking about stakeholders to be really important because it's often unclear who they are, but it's important that your work is serving them well. I found that leadership can generally give the clearest answer, or at least it's worth having them realize that it's unclear. You'll notice that the last question was the same for all cases. I think asking what others think you should focus on gives a great insight into their priorities and helps you identify where people are aligned, or in fact, not. And with that, we'll move to the next step, understand the area. While the first step was all about getting familiar with the people you'll work with, the second is about getting familiar with the content you'll work with. I've seen people try diving in to understand the content first, but I've put it as my second step because I believe building strong relationships with people is really important and can take a long time. I recommend starting with the people and trusting that your skills and your craft will support you when you get to the content. You can also use the people you've met in step one to help you understand the content you'll be working on. I don't expect these to come as a surprise to you, but look to audits, existing research, and interviews with the users. And don't forget to take great notes. For the audit, I recommend doing both an inventory and an analysis. Use your best judgment for how detailed to go with the audit, but I try to time box it to two to three days per site, then another day to review the notes. A good audit will tell you how much you're working with, what's the quality, and show some opportunities. A color-coded audit spreadsheet is also a great output that people are normally pretty impressed by. 
I highly recommend bringing this along to any demos that happen to give visibility into your work. Next, look for any existing research people have done. This might come from a full research team or just be a Google form that someone sent around once. Any insight into the users will help you going forward. You can also look for feedback tickets raised against the docs. Interviewing users yourself is optional, but I highly recommend it if possible. It helps you sympathize with their needs and you can use that to write more informed content. Also, if you do this after looking at existing research, then you can focus your questions on the gaps or the parts that interested you. In my current role, I'm working on internal documentation for engineers. So when I started, I made sure to interview engineers with different tenures at the company, different work experience, and different specialties. Finally, and most importantly, you need to take notes. There can be a lot to absorb in the moment, so having notes will help you spot patterns when you reflect on them later. Now, once you've done an audit and looked through the existing research, you can use the notes you've written to write down some observations. Don't overthink these and write essays. Just use simple sentences with optional explanations. These are some examples based on real observations I've made when starting a new role. What I've listed here are, users are presented with a lot of options, but there's no content to explain the benefits of each. People are looking for guidance on how to use inclusive language in their work. It's not clear where information should go. A remote workforce has increased the importance of documentation. And a few more since I'd like to give you a lot of examples. Page titles are more fun than clear. Technical writing is not well understood. The documentation life cycle is not clear. And it's hard to tell how content is performing. You can see these are just simple sentences, but they capture different ideas. If you come up with a lot, try to group them into a few high level themes so it's easier for others to quickly understand. Next, as well as observations, you can record some user pain points. While the observations came from the audit, the pain points come from the user interviews. Here are some pain points. The documentation is split across too many locations. It's hard to contribute to the documentation. I'm uncertain the documentation will stay up to date. And I spend too much time repeating the same explanations. When you're presenting these, include some verbatim quotes from the interviews. It helps make the problems seem real and adds credibility when others are reading them. On to step three, embrace feedback. It's hard to overstate this, but feedback is a superpower at work. It's collaborative by nature because you're engaging with other people. Because you're engaging with other people, you have a chance to strengthen your connection with them and build trust. Then, with diverse perspectives going into the work, it'll improve the quality of what you can deliver. I know asking for feedback can often feel scary, but the more you incorporate it into your process, the more natural it'll feel. In my experience, people are happy to go out of their way to help you if they know you want it. So just ask. So, ask for feedback. Feedback is useful at all stages of this plan, but I think this is the first key moment. Once you feel comfortable with your, your reflections, share the observations and pain points you've written with your stakeholders. They show some tangible work you've already produced and how you're engaging with the area. This is a chance to make the most of some of the connections you made at the beginning. Ask them what resonates with them or if something seems off. You're new, so people are generally happy to forgive you for being wrong. It'll be much better to realize that you're wrong about something at this stage than after you've spent the effort coming up with a plan to address a problem that doesn't exist. As well as asking about the observations and pain points, you can use this as a chance to get feedback on your working style. Check that the way you're going about this work meets their expectations. 
Again, you're new, so you still have time to course correct if they're not responding well. As well as asking for feedback, you can also start giving feedback. You've actually done quite a lot with the company by this point. There are the interviews you went through and working with HR, onboarding sessions and the docs they provide. Then you may also have gone through some setup for your development environment. Look at your notes from these and help those around you. We've just talked about how useful getting feedback can be, so help others with your experiences. Now, on to step four, find quick wins. Since you've confirmed your observations, it's time to put them to use. Each observation is an opportunity to change something. It could be fixing something bad or amplifying something good. Either way, these will help you find some quick wins. Quick wins are a powerful way to show your value when you're working as a sole writer or with people who aren't sure of your role. Make sure to use your knowledge about how work is done to inform what will be quick and avoid what seems quick but will likely snowball. Earlier, I showed some example observations. Well now, let's look at them and identify some quick wins. So firstly, users are presented with a lot of options, but there's no content to explain the benefits of each. I think this could be a quick win. It's a chance to put together an overview page that presents the options and provides some contrast between them. Next, people are looking for guidance on how to use inclusive language in their work. I also think this can be a quick win. It's something people have been asking for a lot this year, and I think we're in a good position to look at existing guidance and style guides to pull together an entry to include in some company documentation. Next, a remote workforce has increased the importance of documentation. This one's not really a quick win, but it's useful to highlight to get buy-in. And finally, page titles are more fun than clear. I think this one is definitely a quick win. You can get in and update some of those titles. You can use your fresh eyes as a newbie to say that it's difficult to scan the titles and understand what content would be there. If you face pushback on this, look to other newbies to get their feedback too. You'll likely find similar experiences. I've got a few more. The observation that technical writing is not well understood. This one is also more for buy-in and visibility, not really a quick win. The documentation life cycle is not clear. I think this one's a trap, avoid it for now. And it's not clear where information should go. Similar to the last one, I think this is a trap in that there's a lot of content strategy sitting behind it. I don't think it's a quick win. It's something to put more in your longer term thinking. And the final one, it's hard to tell how content is performing. Depending on the systems being used at your company, this one can be a quick win. For example, in my current role, I noticed that there was a feedback mechanism used for the product the company builds, but it wasn't being used on the documentation. I was able to quickly integrate it into the documentation site, and now we get page ratings and written feedback on the docs. If some of those still seem too big, these are some of the smallest wins I could think of. They'll still be helpful and let you get your foot in the door. I've listed code samples, broken links, typos, and procedure style. The first three are about fixing errors in the page. We know that when readers find errors, they lose trust in the documentation. So when, when you can fix those up, it will improve the quality. The final one, procedure style, is something I've noticed when joining places that don't have an established writing team. People tend to write long catch-all pages that mix up conceptual content and procedures. The procedures end up getting written as part of long paragraphs. So something quick that you can do is go in and pull out the steps of a procedure into a numbered list. This will make the content clearer and separating these content types will help improve the docs. A medium win that I wanted to highlight because it's been my most successful version of this so far is to work on an information architecture. I basically use this to gain context while producing something to show for it at the end. 
As part of the project, I did an audit, I looked at external sites, I performed a card sort, then I used that information to put together a prototype, which I was able to test, and then finally put forward a proposal. This is a significant amount of work, but there's output at each step that you can point to, so it makes an excellent presentation. IA is a great example because it's a problem many people recognize but don't know how to solve. This gives you the opportunity to step in and show your expertise by highlighting the nature of the problem and then resolving it with evidence. As part of that, join demos. By demos, I just mean any presentations where people show their work. This is another power move. It's good to show the problem you were thinking about and the solution you're proposing. This will bring people along the journey with you and helps them understand the type of task you can do. This is particularly useful when you're working as a sole writer because people may not understand what your job entails, and this shows the depth of thought and why something may take a certain period of time. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest success I've had with this was showing off the IA project I talked about. I found that talking through the process and showing the interesting visual results you get from a tool like Optimal Workshop can elicit a bunch of oohs and ahs, as well as triggering some good discussion. So get out there, be visible, and show you're working. And now, this is the final step, setting longer term goals. This is when you use the momentum you've gained through the quick wins to get buy-in for projects that are more challenging and will take a longer time. To set these longer term goals, I suggest you put together a vision. You can put this together from your observations and pain points. The vision describes the ideal state you want to get to. It should be something that will stay the same for a long time. It shouldn't be too prescriptive and it should be ambitious. You should feel a bit uncomfortable with how hard it will be to get there because that helps you make good compromises. For example, if you observe that people don't know where information goes, then part of your vision could be that people have a strong mental model of where different types of content belong. As well as thinking about the content, think about how your team fits into the vision as well. Part of your vision could be that you've grown the team or that you set goals based on metrics like page performance and feedback. So simply put, Observations plus pain points, along with some time to reflect on them, will turn into your vision. Alongside the vision, you can create a roadmap. The roadmap lays out different projects that will get you to the vision. You can roughly size the projects and show how they are prioritized. Remember to use what you've learned about the company to track your work in the same way other people do. If you're looking to grow the team, then the roadmap is a really useful tool. You can use it to show how much progress you can make by yourself, versus how much you could do with additional people. Don't go too crazy since you've just joined, but if the rest of the company is growing, then it's likely you'll need to as well to keep pace. Now, because this is my first time speaking at a conference, and I know how great the Write the Docs community is, I'm going to add a bonus step. When you're going for a new role, remember that interviews are a two-way process. You should also interview them to make sure you're confident it's a good fit for you. Think about asking, what are their expectations of the role? What support will they provide? What's the organization structure? I think everyone knows this, but it's very easy to forget in the moment and just be focused on selling yourself. Don't forget to interrogate the opportunity to check it's what you want. Job ads are often pretty vague. Actually, if you get the chance to write a job description, I think we're well positioned to make them a bit more useful. So that's the end of my steps. In summary, when you're looking for a new role, remember to interview the company as well. Then once you've got the role, Listen to get the context, understand the area, embrace feedback, find quick wins, 
and set longer term goals. These are a few resources that I found useful when I've approached starting new roles and helped form a lot of the strategy I've mentioned in this talk. I particularly recommend the book, The First 90 Days. It has a more general version of the steps I've talked about. That's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. I've really enjoyed this chance to present. And again, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thanks. Hey, Michael, thanks so much for joining us for a bit of uh, Q&A after your excellent first time talk. Congratulations on the, the first run through. It was awesome. Thank you. Really, really good. And it seems that um, everyone really enjoyed it because we've probably had the most questions um, on your session uh, that so far today. So I think we should, without further ado, get stuck into some. There seems to be um, two sort of themes emerging from the questions that I've seen about uh, your talk, Michael. So sort of like broken down into more transition questions, like transitioning between the developing to documenting and also the whole audit and docs impact thing as well. Um, so I think we might start off with um, a, a, the transitioning questions. And um, one of the questions was, um, you. Um, so you've moved from de developing to documenting. What was the biggest challenge you faced in your transition to writing? And um, if you've got any other tips um, for those who may want to do the same thing, what would those be? Yeah, so in terms of challenges, I think you get exposed to a lot more that you need to deal with. Uh, so working in a development team, I think you you'll kind of get shielded a lot by people. But normally, in my experience so far, at least working as a writer, you are more on your own, uh, which has lots of like great autonomy and uh, really exciting things that you get to do. But it does mean you now have to deal with that kind of stakeholder engagement side strategy buy-in, all those kind of things as well. So it's not just that the craft has changed, there can be a lot of extra things that go along with it, which can be challenging. Um, yeah, in terms of tips though, I think uh, recognize that you've got a lot of good stuff already that you should bring with you to the new role. So for example, I've, there's a blog post in this that I have been meaning to write for a long time in terms of, uh, a lot of development shares the same principles uh, as good content design in terms of like how are you naming your variables so that they can be used by people in future that are maintaining the code? How is the code structured in terms of like an information architecture so that it makes sense for people to delve in from a certain layer and work out where they should be going next? Um, so all of that kind of stuff. And then also planning your work. Uh, I gave, there was a note that I shouted out Jira during the, uh, talk because I very much like planning my work through Jira and I think that came from working on a development team and having that as the just the default way that we do things I've kind of carried that on um, and so that kind of gave me a strong planning side that I came into the role with uh, even though it wasn't like content design specific so yeah I think that's the main stuff that's really good yeah I think you're right about like you know using the tools that you know you've you accustomed to in your your other life before technical writing, because you're right, there's a lot of the time, there's a lot of crossover um, between, you know, the tools that developers use and the tools that technical writers use. So definitely good insight there for sure. Mm. Um, so um, another sort of transition related question is, um, would you have any special tips or advice, particularly for folks who come from non IT backgrounds uh, into technical writing for software um, at all? Like any um, uh, tips for making the jump yeah, um, so I think there are kind of two things that spring to mind. If you're interested in getting into the, like delving into the technical side, I think just being curious is going to be the key thing. The more you delve into like coding and stuff, the more you'll find there's not one way of doing things. Uh, so you need to make sure that you have that kind of curiosity to see, you may have learned one way of doing things, but then someone will show you that in a different circumstance, another way actually is preferable. And so being curious to understand that those things can coexist, um, I think is important. Uh, in terms of moving into, oh, there was something else that I thought of that's now gone from my mind. Oh, that's right. I think an important thing for someone moving into documenting a more technical field is making sure your kind of investigative skills are good. So when you're talking to a subject matter expert, come prepared with questions to know what you want to get out of it. Um, I think this was touched on earlier with perhaps talking to turnips. 
uh, where you need to, uh, I think my tip would be to come prepared with the questions. You may not understand all of it, but because if you can come with like a framework of what do I need to understand, what does the user need to understand, and how do I communicate that, I think that's key. It doesn't mean that you have to fully understand it yourself. It's more about just asking sort of intelligent questions yeah. rather than just coming in just dry without anything at all, right? That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so on to audit and, and docs impact sort of theme questions here. And I think we might have enough time to get through all these if we're super speedy. Um, so have you um, got a bit of a good docs audit method? Because I know you're, you're sort of covering that a bit in the presentation uh, a little bit. But have you found a good um, audit method or way of doing things or even tool that um, helps you um, get the audits done efficiently? I don't think I have anything glamorous to add. It's a, a spreadsheet um, with a kind of set structure that I have learned from previous experience, uh, which breaks down to, into like the identifying information, metrics that you're getting, and then judgments that you're making. And so those first two columns are pretty quick to fill out uh, because it's just the info that you have there and you pull it out from Google or Confluence, whatever analytics uh, you can get. And then the meat is that, uh, judgment kind of portion. And that's where I would normally do a, f a chunk of it first and then go back and check that you're actually getting what you want from the audit. I've fallen into the, the hole the first time I did an audit was I got through all of it and then I looked back at it and thought I didn't really pull out the key stuff that I wanted because you kind of learned it as you went. And so I think as much planning you can do up front, but then also being flexible to f be open to what you discover as you go through it and build that into it as well. Right, yeah, that actually does make a lot of sense. Good one. Um, so um, what do you think are some of the ways people can use to, I guess, figure out how much impact documentation they've sort of written is having? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's, a, what's a good way of measuring it? I mean, that's a, it's a tough thing. Uh, it depends on what you have access to. I think there are obvious methods like uh, metrics that you can get about the site to determine usage, how long people are spending looking at it. Um, there's also like qualitative feedback that you can get. So can you get uh, written feedback from your users uh, is really useful. Uh, also, if you have access to your users, then the occasional survey I think is useful as well uh, or interview. Um, I would say uh, something I've noticed, like it's important to make sure you coordinate that type, like the uh, interviews and surveys with other efforts that people are making to work with your users because you don't want to overload them. But if you can perhaps combine your efforts with research that's already being done or work out kind of a cadence that you want to check um, and using that kind of qualitative feedback, I think is really compelling when you show it to uh, someone that's asking for the value of your work. Um, the other obvious one that I just thought of is obviously like support tickets. Uh, if you're working with external facing stuff, and you can talk to support and find out what their biggest areas uh, are, like that, that problems they're having, then providing documentation targeting that and looking at the decrease in support cases will be a, a pretty safe way to go. Mm, yeah, those are all really good tips. Great stuff. Well, that, I can't believe it. That's a, another end of a 10 minute uh, Q&A session there. Um, so that went very quickly. But I think we were both expecting it, given the uh, amount of questions that we had asked there, Michael. So thanks again for, for joining us in the chat. And um, if you've got any follow-up questions, um, folks, where can they find you on the social media, Michael? Uh, so I LinkedIn and Twitter, um, Michael Belton on LinkedIn, MyKale37 on Twitter. Uh, I had it in my slides. I can post it in the chat. Uh, but I'll also be around for the rest of the conference, obviously. So feel free to reach out uh, and we can have a chat. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, Michael.